Hello everyone. Um, welcome to what is the 30th, I believe, of our Light in the Tunnel series with Paula and Monash Architecture. Um, firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today. Um, myself, I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also by extension, acknowledge the Eastern Kulin, uh, the lands on which Monash University sits. Um, it's been a mad year. So I think we'll, we'll close out the year that must not be named um, in the hope of 2021 being a much nicer place to be. Um, and our talk well, today is about good citizens. So what does it mean to be a good citizen in the built environment profession? What are the avenues for participating? What does speaking up and organizing in the public realm mean for our professional lives individually and collectively? Um, and we're joined today by Tanya and Colleen and I'll hand over to Justine to do the, the fun bits um and pick up the conversation later on thank you sarah hi everybody um very excited to be here for number 30 and i'm particularly pleased that sarah is here as our co-host today because the name of this session came from an email sarah sent as we were discussing in parlor you know whether we should do some online events and sarah said how about a kind of light at the end of the tunnel kind of vibe thingy whatever and we went that's the, that's the answer, that's the title. So it's really great to have you here for the last one, Sarah. Um, it's, as it's, I'm kind of overwhelmed that we're up to number 30 and thank you. So thank you everyone for coming along to so many of these sessions and making them so successful. Um, I'm looking forward to having a break and I'm sure you are all too, but thank you for coming to uh, seeing us through to the very end. Um, so, of course, as always, please make sure your microphone's on mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, it is really great if you can keep your camera on um, so we can see everybody, you know, there together. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen right now so we can see you all. Um, uh, and as you know, we, we take questions throughout the session. So if you've got a question, pop it into the chat function, um, we will um, then ask people to turn on their cameras if they're not on um, and put the question directly to the speakers. If you can't do that, just let us know in the chat and we will um, put the question for you. We probably won't get to all of them, um, uh, but of course, as you know, those the questions and commentary that happens in the chat really does inform what we do next. And in fact, this session um, was informed by a comment that Tanya made at a previous session where she, I don't, think, I don't know if it was in the chat or if it was even in a text where she uh, said, to, said that she thought, you know, one of the key things was really to think about what it is to be a good citizen. And so we're very pleased that Tanya has joined us uh, to talk about that topic. And she also has ri just written a very good piece on, on Parlour, which is on our website. Um, so uh, we're very happy that Colleen has joined Tanya for this discussion. I think it's going to be, and we're all exhausted, but I think it's going to be a really lively, um, opinionated and forthright conversation. So I'm really looking forward to it. So let me introduce um, our speakers. Tanya is an architect and co-founder of the architectural research practice Oopla. She is the president of Citizen, oh, she was. Are you still president? No. Yeah, no, I'm still president. No, I got back. Yeah, I came back. Okay, she's president of Citizen for Melbourne, the public space advocacy group that ran the Our City, Our Square campaign, uh, which advocates for Federation Square's public space, initially by opposing the demolition of the Yarra building and its replacement with the Apple Store. Tanya does many, many things in architecture and she did an earlier session for us talking about that kind of breadth of activity. Um, she's a writer, a maker of installations, a curator and educator and advocate. She's a registered architect and she's currently finishing her PhD. <laughs> Which I wrote, wrote that sentence a few months ago. I thought you would have finished by now. <laughs> Over what can I say? Anyway. anyway, so, and we're very happy to be joined by Colleen Peterson. Colleen's a town planner and managing director of Ratio Consultants. She's a, a very strong public advocate in relation to uh, social justice and planning issues, including the profession's role in delivering better outcomes and the impact of planning decisions on built form and equitable access. Uh, She's interested in how built environment professionals can use their leverage to advocate for political issues. And she, we had lined her up as a speaker for the conference that theoretically uh, I was meant to be involved with this year, which was called Leverage. Um, 
that unfortunately didn't go ahead. So I'm really happy to have Colleen here um, to have at least some of the conversation that we might have had um, should had COVID not derailed uh, the Leverage Conference. Um, so welcome both of you. Um, and I thought we might just start off with a very simple but quite wide ranging question of what does it mean to be a good citizen as a built environment professional? Penny, you want to go first? Should I go? I was seeing as I've written the article, it should be yeah. fresh in my head, shouldn't it? Um, well, I've been thinking about citizenship for a little while, which is hence the text I sent to Justine and hence me speaking here. And it kind of gave me a, a way to think a little bit more broadly about it. But um, I started thinking outside of our profession and just simply what it means to be a good citizen first. And if we think about being a citizen of a country, we have individual rights by being a citizen and we have responsibilities or I think responsibilities um, to the collective good. Um, so we might have individual rights that we, you know, we can vote, we, uh, you know, we get passports, we get certain diplomatic assistance overseas. But I also think that good societies formed through the civic bonds that we create through building community. So um, a lot for me about being a good citizen is actually thinking about the collective good and the public benefit and where we want to be as a society, not just as individuals. So I think our individual rights are important, um, but I think they're balanced by um, a kind of a collective responsibility or a responsibility that we have as individuals to the collective. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll probably take a slightly... Um less intellectual approach to Tanya and it's um, more about really having some ownership over making a positive contribution to the world that we live in. Um, as people, we all work, practice, earn a living from the built environment. Um, I feel quite passionately that we have an ongoing commitment and responsibility to ensuring that we leave um, our city and our places in a better place than where we started. And so it, it really, to me, bears out of that, that um, it can be can seen as a moral or an ethical issue. It can be seen as a, a professional issue, but that ultimately, I think we have a responsibility to contribute in a constructive and positive manner um, to the world that we live. So, so Tanya, I'm really interested that I mean, I know you've been in the advocacy for a long time and you're both really quite, you know, really striking for the advocacy work that you do. So how, do, how does thinking about the sort of idea of citizenship, um, how does that play out in terms of architects, other kinds of built environment professionals? I know you say we need to be a good citizen first, but what does it mean to be a good, good architectural citizen, I think was a phrase you used, or maybe a good planning citizen as well? <laughs> well, for me, I think... Um... I think it talks about participation. So I think, and you know, this is this also goes to Colleen's point about leaving the world, in a, like you can't actually leave the world in a better place unless you participate. Oh. Um, so we need to think about ways within our profession and the profession surrounding us that we can actually participate and make a contribution and contribute to leaving the world in a better place. And we can do it in so many different ways. I mean, we can do it kind of at a cultural level, the cultural level of our profession, like how do we structure our offices and our workplaces? What kind of things do we get involved in? And then we can do it at a broader level, at a community level, because the built environment touches on so many people's lives. It's kind of, you know, it's everywhere. You, you know, you live in a house, you step outside onto a street that somebody's hopefully thought about. Um, you know, you work out if you can cross the road at a curb because somebody's, you know, if you've got a pram because somebody's thought about the curb ramp or not. Um, there are all these little ways that we can make a difference. And I think it's just kind of, it's kind of sitting in the background or underlying um, how we practice is, you know, how can we make a difference through what we do? And we have so much opportunity in the work that we do because we shape the built environment. We have so much opportunity to do fantastic things. We also have a lot of opportunity to do really bad things if we're not thoughtful. And so maybe it's about being thoughtful. Mm at a very ground level. 
sorry, Justin. I was just going to say, I think too, as professions, architects perhaps underestimate their their ability to influence and get involved. Mm. And that um, I'm not sure if that comes about um, through some systemic challenges with architectural practices and big versus small, male dominated versus not. I mean, it's obviously um, complex and multi-layered, but I, I think that architects have an incredible opportunity to be speaking up and having a contribution. And as Tanya says, that can occur on so many levels in so many ways. And whether it's the conversations you're having, you know, at a barbecue in the park to being more actively involved with issues, whether it be saving Federation Square or, um, you know, there's a whole myriad of other issues that are facing us, including, of course, affordable housing. To me, that's one of the really big issues that we're grappling with at the moment. Um, but I would really encourage architects to have confidence that they have got um, ideas, they are, they are valued, and that co that collective good comes from speaking up. So I'm just going to say one more thing before I'm taking over the questions yet again. But I mean, the reason I'm one of the things I think is very interesting about this is that it shifts the conversation from architects whinging that no one understands us and someone should educate the public about how important we are to it shifts that it, it, which is a real you know it's so entrenched in architecture it's, so, it's just every public conversation ends up with people with the kind of whinging that no one understands us and I think talking about one's you know the, our responsibilities as citizens to in, in relation to the participation just short circuits all of that and kind of says so how are you going to stand up and you know I don't know I suppose I'm just editorializing now but Tanya maybe you I mean this is where the interesting thing about being public I suppose comes in because one of the things that Christine and I are interested in doing through Oopla is creating comfort creating public conversations around the built environment. And one of the things I think that's always driven me in terms of that is the idea that through these public conversations, we can actually increase public literacy around the built environment and the way we shape the city and our towns, um, you know, all the way down to our footpaths. So, and for me, that that is the thing that will increase people valuing architecture and built environment professionals. Whinging about it won't, but raising the bar at a public level um, will. Now, not everybody has the opportunity to kind of speak at a public level or the ability to speak at a public level, but, um, you know, there are lots of, I think there are lots of different ways to get involved, but I do think um, public advocacy in some way, shape or form is incredibly important because of that. Yeah. And Tanya, I think you've hit it on the head because it's not about architects necessarily speaking up about the very literal aspect of architecture, whether a, a building design is good or bad and looking at it in that very purest sense, but it's about how is our building evolving and being created? How are we creating spaces for the people or are they against the people? How are we creating more sustainable environments, you know, integrating um, pedestrian, more cycling friendly environments? You know, they're the issues that, you know, architects should be speaking up about because they are the biggest issues um, that affect our city and that's not to say that whether or not a building is or isn't beautiful or does or doesn't work from a design perspective they're important but in terms of how they affect our community and future generations I mean as we know through the Gatton fuel towers a building's always temporary but it's the framework that sits around it that's what's long lasting mm. so if I could jump in sorry Justine um, before we sort of talk a little bit about the advocacy path and maybe what you're advocating for at the moment, I wonder if you can step back a little bit and define what good means in the context of good citizen. What's the criteria that you apply to that when you think about being a good citizen? What does that mean to you? Mm. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Because good and value, um, I suppose, are always negotiated in lots of respects. Um, and I think, I mean, it's hard to get to good just immediately. But one of the things that I kind of discovered through the Fed Square fight was that the way we define public space is negotiated, right? So it's actually through social interaction and people speaking up in different formats that we actually define certain things in society. Um, 
So if we think about public space in America, if you think about Times Square as an example of what an American might think of as public space, that to me is a very different form of public space, say to Fed Square or an Australian understanding of public space. Tiananmen Square is different too. And so, so by speaking up around what we think is acceptable in these certain ways, we're kind of collectively defining uh, you know, our Australian understanding of public space. And when things change, they have these knock-on effects. And so I'm not uh, entirely, you know, that's one of those existential questions, what is good? Um, I'd like to think that I try to be a good citizen most of the time, but as we all know, it's not that easy. Um, but I'd like to think that I'm taking part in helping to define what good is or what being a good citizen is by acting hopefully with responsibility, with integrity, thinking about um, the things I value and the things I think people should value um, and, you know, trying to reinforce them. So I think the challenge too sometimes is what is good for one person can be quite different for another person. And, you know, my primary experience of that is um, I first stepped into public advocacy, I would have been nearly um, eight years ago now around the residential zone debate and the former um, Planning Minister Matthews Guy proposal to what I would describe as lock most of Melbourne away into one and two dwelling type um, or the neighbourhood residential zone. And of course, I saw that and many in our profession saw that as an opportunity to really lock wealth and establish wealth in land and to deny access and entry into um, housing for many people. And we know through the rising cost of housing in Melbourne that it, it is an ongoing and perennial issue. But yet for many people, they had a very contrary view that that was not appropriate, that they wanted to protect their streets and their environments and they didn't want to see the rise of infill housing. And so I think this idea about what is good and what is not is always up for debate. But that they're debates that we should be having. Um, I mean, there are some things that one would like to think are um, undisputable so climate change being the very obvious one that surely we should you know in 2020 we don't need to be having a debate about climate change and of course the quite wholesale changes we need to make to address it um, but on these perhaps some of these other issues I think it is good for us to have debate and as long as that that debate is respectful then hopefully at the end of the day we get better outcomes and at least better understanding across the the community and different groups. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting, I think, that you bring that up because it's, I suppose you talk about the common, you know, when, when people talk about this, you talk about the common good a little bit and, um, you know, the, like the safe injecting room, the new safe injecting room that's been proposed in Melbourne is, is, is around that. And for some people, you know, there are certain things that are just not good, but the reality is, is like, how do you actually start to, um, how do you actually start to deal with it in a way that, um, really brings up, makes people understand that it's not black, like it's not black and white, mm -hmm. you know, that actually certain things are needed and what are the trade-offs? Like what do we need to actually trade off to get better outcomes in life? So I think there's always, almost always going to be a trade-off in, in terms of who's happy with the common good. Um, but but what we allow and what we advocate for actually goes to our social values. Yeah, um, so yeah, it's not easy, I don't think. Do you think there's equity in that process? Um, you know, if you think of it at face value, the, the loudest voice might get heard the most and the process of debate allows for that discussion to happen. Do you think that there's equity of, or diversity of views? No, I think um, often you're absolutely right, the loudest voice uh, gets gets kind of heard. And I think what's really interesting in the Local Government Act that's come into being this year in Victoria, um, it actually talks about local councils being required to conduct meaningful community consultation. Now, I don't think any council knows what that looks like yet, but there are deliber deliberative democratic processes where they deliberately source um, not just the community groups that speak up, but they deliberately source a cross section of the population. They're kind of demographic analysis that's done. And apparently they have to have participated in a conversation on this a couple of weeks ago. Apparently to get 50 people that represent your demographic, they have to ask 10,000 people. And I was just shocked, but apparently that's normal. <laughs> but so, so basically what you're doing is you're kind of creating a citizen's assembly through that process. 
And the processes do take longer. The idea is that um, instead of just asking people very black and white things about issues, they actually give them a lot of information. Um, you know, it might take place over six weeks or two months and they try to pay people to participate in these processes. Um, and so what that does is that kind of um, hopefully removes some of the shoutier voices or just balances the voices, creates more balance. And I'd love to, I can't wait to see how that plays out. And I think it can play out in the built environment stuff that local government does as well. Um, I don't know if lo local government has thought of it in that way. They're probably terrified, like ab <laughs> absolutely terrified of it, but I'm interested in it. Yeah. I mean, the reality is for as long as time memorial, there has been real power imbalance about communities and expression and whether you're a person of colour or a person whose English is not their first language, if you're a woman, um, that there are a whole range of factors that influence our ability to be heard and to be taken seriously. And I was just reading in the comments, Lindy Burton makes a really good point about the public housing lockdown and yeah. it's obviously um, a really contentious decision made by the state government um, I don't necessarily want to weigh into the specifics of it, but it's a really good example of a highly disenfranchised, susceptible um, component or part of our community living in a physical environment, which is a legacy of a time or a bygone era that effectively imprisoned them for, for days on end. Um, I think it shows, A, the implications of what we do as a profession, um, but also the capacity for those people to have all their power taken from them for the greater good. Um, and there's no doubt that, you know, a few thousand people paid a very large price um, to try and keep the rest of Melbourne safe. And not necessarily for, um, well, I think it could be done better. I think the Ombudsman re report for that has been released this morning and it was found to violate um, the Victorian Human Rights Charter. So um, it's an interesting thing to look through. I've just scanned through the overview of it. So if anybody's interested in that, you can look it up at the moment. Mm. I wonder, I guess, building on that, um, if you could talk in the context of advocacy that you've done in the past, do you find that it's more of a reactive approach or an active approach? I think for me, um, I first started really getting into advocacy around this residential zone issue and it was very much a reaction. Um, I, like many people, um, was in my mid-30s, or not that everyone's in their mid-30s, but you know, I was head down, bum up, earning a living, had two small children, um, you know, trying to run a business and obviously pay off mortgages and all those day-to-day -day activities. So, you know, my life was pretty full and busy just getting by. Um, but this issue came about and I think for the first time ever I really thought about well for me personally I own my own home or at least the bank owns some of it I own the rest of it um, you know I have housing security but what does that mean for my children and for other people that are not as fortunate as I am and it was the first time that I really started to really extensively think about well what sort of legacy do I want to lead um, you know when I go out and about and I tell people I'm a town planner and I don't know whether architects get this, but there's always a fair bit of eye rolling and um, blaming um, for all the city ills of the city. And particularly people love to get a kidney punch in about traffic planning. Um, but it was really the first opportunity for me to really say, this is something that I actually do really care about. And I care about us creating a set of planning rules that just make it consistently more and more difficult for housing to be seen as a basic human right as opposed to a vehicle for wealth creation. Um, and I, I sound surprisingly more sort of socialist than I probably really am, but um, the way in which the government was trying to um, really leverage property as a political gain as opposed to, as I say, a, a basic human right really irked me and it really just grew from there. And um, I think to some degree it does need to be reactionary because, as Tanya, I'm sure you'll agree, it takes so much time and commitment in order to properly get involved with advocacy. It has to be something that you're really passionate and and 
you know, really are prepared to sacrifice and fight for. And I don't think it's something where, you know, there's lots of issues in the world that, that are worthy of fighting, but you've got to find that thing that really um, speaks to your soul if you're going to be prepared to really put the time and the effort and the energy in to hopefully make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Because it takes a lot of energy. I, I do think it's probably, in some ways it is almost reactive because we all just kind of roll along you know you roll along you roll with the punches you you know you wear a mask if Dan tells you to at the moment and um and it is those things that kind of then just get under your skin and you know really it's it's that that kind of friction but I think also you know if we just all there there kind of has to be some friction to get public debate going um and so yeah so it does tend a lot to be it does tend to be reactive. Um, whether it always needs to be reactive, I, I don't know. I'm, we're kind of working out what we do next with the Citizens for Melbourne and, and how that goes and, and, and thinking about it as a broader, broader kind of public space advocacy group. Um, Would have thought though, Tanya, the need for that group is more important than ever. We've obviously seen through COVID how incredibly important those public spaces are mm. and clearly they need to be protected. And of course they yep. need enhanced and I live opposite a very popular park in Richmond that's become quite a destination during COVID mm. um, and I'm really pleased to see that the council does at least on the surface appear to be putting quite a bit of effort to say well how do we enhance and support this space to further support our community. Yeah absolutely so I suppose we're shifting from campaign mode like you know when you're kind of you're in camp campaign mode is very different to maybe communication mode and kind of um you know starting to talk about what what value means and using this moment to kind of see what we can open up open up to do with that um so we'll just have to see what happens whether that's as you know some people find that not as effective necessarily but um you know we've recently made a submission there was a a, a parliamentary inquiry into environmental infrastructure and it had almost no terms of reference but it was talking about public space um, so we made a submission, like a, a submission to that. And I have no idea where that goes or what that means. Um, but we're starting to do these, those things in that space. We helped, um, we were part of the stakeholder consultation group for the Market Square Charter, uh, which is really interesting at the Queen Vic Markets. Um, and this idea that um, it's actually quite interesting. It's like how, how do you define, it's, it's in some ways it's, goes to Sarah's question about how do you define being a good citizen? Well, how do you define good public space? And so this idea that there might be some guidelines or albeit very broad guidelines in place around certain things um, becomes really important. Like I've, I've only recently realized in the past couple of years that Australia didn't have, a, a, the, at a federal level, doesn't have a human rights charter. I'm really interested in the fact that the Victorian human rights charter doesn't have the right to housing enshrined in it for example wow. um yeah I, i'm pretty sure of that i read it fairly recently i'd like you know but um you know that's really to me those things are really problematic and what that meant because they kind of they start to give us guidelines on how on how to act and if somebody then acts incorrectly we can say hey no you've got this you know you've got this thing and it gives it gives citizens a way to actually have a voice in a space where they might not have formal voices so what we found with Fed Square is with, when the planning minister took away any kind of um, route for public comment, like you start to understand what all those heritage groups have, you know, there's just this frustration that there are no formal processes, no ways for them to have a voice in these formal processes. And so what things like charters and guidelines um, and those kind of things do is actually allow the public to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. um, that was quite tangential. Sorry, I don't know where we started, um, but I've ended just there. <laughs> well, one thing I'm kind of interested in, in with both you both is neither of you had a neither of you really had a pre-existing platform. I mean, you were both articulate. You both, you know, I mean, Tanya, I know you'd been writing criticism, but neither of you had a established platform on which to launch this these very advocacy projects and. So I'm kind of just curious about how, like, how did you make space for the voices that you wanted to have, like, collectively and the, and and individually. Um, partly for me, it 
some of that space came through the support of the directors of the company that I work for. So I was lucky in that um, I was able to talk with the other directors. They all collectively, and at that firm, the firm, the firm was much smaller. So there was, I think, six of us at the time. And we were able to have a roundtable discussion to say, this is an important issue. This is something that we do want to speak up about. We were also very mindful that in doing that, um, making enemies of the planning minister as planning consultants is possibly not the best financial decision to make. But I'm very proud of the fact that the, the director said, no, this is bigger than that. And we think ultimately our clients will respect us for speaking up. And as long as we're respectful and um, diplomatic in our advocacy, um, that they're either, you know, that, that, that they should respect us for the action that we've taken. So um, there's no doubt that some of the room in my life came from my fellow directors making time for that and obviously then enabling me to then call on the help of a number of others within the profession for them to also get up and get involved. And in the end, there were about 30 of us um, that were quite actively involved in preparing submissions and evidence and advocacy amongst a whole range of panel hearings that were held across various um, metropolitan councils um, advocating um, to reduce the extent of the neighbourhood residential zone. And in the end, while the zones did proceed, the extent of the zones being rolled out was not as extensive in the areas that we were able to actively participate in. So we're quite proud of that. Yeah, I suppose for me, I was lucky. I was writing a PhD, I still am, as Justine reminded me earlier on. <laughs> um, and it aligns with the work I'm doing in my PhD. I didn't quite expect the advocacy to take up as much space in my life as it did. Um, however, it does form the final chapter of my PhD. Woohoo! So nice to go out and win. Um, so that was lucky. But in terms of actually having a platform, um, you know, we had to build that. So I had written a piece uh, when Matthew Guy was the planning minister. He put Fed Square East as an expression of interest out to tender. And in those tender documents, it said that they were going to give that site, that development over to the developers when it was finished. Um, and this was kind of, this is, I suppose, the start of my interest in charters. I knew that Fed Square ran on a charter um, that governed its public kind of spaces and its public use. Um, and so the article was around the fact that that was a really important thing and that Fed Square East would be a really important site in relation to Fed Square when it was developed and that we needed to kind of think about what the public good was that was coming out of that site. So somebody contact, so I was contacted by Architecture Australia, uh, Architecture AU, and I wrote an article on the Apple Store. And then um, part of the way we built voice is that Rohan, Rohan Story, an urban heritage consultant, got the people together who'd written stuff about it. He got the petition holders together and we had a few other uh, concerned citizens that came along. So the way we build up, we, we started from a good point in terms of a platform because we had about, we had two petition holders as part of our association and we held about 50,000 signatures through that. The third petition holder wasn't interested in doing anything and ended up closing his petition. Um, and then we had people who'd written stuff and we, you know, we had expertise around the built environment. So we started from there. Um, and then we just really slowly built voice like we just jumped on every opportunity um luckily one of our petition holders was also a media guy yay um it still terrifies me all the media stuff but it's also but he knew how that worked he knew who to call to get interviews and to um and another guy on our in our group had written media like press releases for some some department in government um for a while at some point um, and so we were able to kind of just jump on it every opportunity and at every opportunity um, we tried to build our voice and we tried to build our list, uh, you know, until we were doing things like facilitating thousands of submissions to government um, in response to the, the heritage permit. Um, but it was slow, like it was just slow. You have to do it slowly and you find your allies um, and you hopefully put people around you who can help you execute because you can't do it. You can't do it alone. Um, as I think what Colin, you said you had 30 people, a group of 30 people. That's fantastic. 
They needed a lot of wrangling, though. Oh, yeah, wrangling. <laughs> Hurting the cats. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ideas that kind of just couldn't be yeah, executed for money or just time or whatever, but you've got to kind of work your way. You kind of plot your way through what's going to get you the most bang for your buck at the particular time that you're at, understanding that everybody's volunteering their time pretty much. I wonder, um, oh, Justine, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, Sarah, should we, we've got um, quite a lot of commentary going here. Um, I wonder if Philip Pender, Philip, do you want to um, put your comment about social housing, which I know is an area that both Tanya and Colleen have particular interest in as well. Sorry, did, did you ask if I wanted to elaborate? Yes, just put your question to <laughs> I We just like you to ask them rather than me read them out. Oh, no, sure. Um, yeah, no, so I actually did my, um, my uh, final project for my master's in on the on public housing and the public housing renewal program. But right when I finished about a month ago, they've announced a $5.4 billion investment in social housing. And I think one thing that... Uh, my my thesis revealed was that there's so much complexity just in the term social housing and public housing and while you know as architects we can engage in uh you know affordable housing and public housing programs and this sort of thing the way they operate has so much depth and complexity that we might not always uh initially realize uh some of the more nefarious aspects of those programs. So, yeah, I don't know. I was just kind of reflecting on, on that idea of how there's often conflicts in what we would like to do, but the higher powers that sort of dictate the way that that actually operates. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess maybe a question would be if any of you have experienced that in your careers or practice, a kind of uh, ethical dilemma that's come up in the project you've worked on or something. Well, I think there's, as, as planners, we have almost nothing to do with social housing in that when it is provided, it's almost always exempt from planning controls. I think maybe just as a more general observation, I think that we have somehow managed to make the provision of social housing so much more complicated than it really needs to be. And to some degree, I think we need to go back more to a first principles basis and there needs to be the introduction of um, certainly controls and mechanisms that ensure that, for example, property owners effectively, whether it's a tax or a levy or there's some kind of incentivization for a minimum percentage of new housing to be provided in the form of social housing. And of course, every year that we delay in doing that is a year that we are further um, or failing to provide the amount of social housing that we need in Victoria. And it's certainly something that I've seen done quite effectively in a number of places in the US. And um, it's not very often that one would like to say that the US is doing something better than Australia, but in terms of being far more proactive in requiring affordable social housing to be provided upfront. And in some areas, for example, in Washington and in San Francisco, 20% of all new housing is either affordable or social housing. So, you know, that's a, a massive learning curve for us. And we need a government that has the political mandate and will to make those sorts of changes and they need to get onto it now. Yeah, we're really playing catch up in Victoria. I mean, it's a great, it's been a great announcement. It's fantastic. But we are playing catch up. I mean, one of the interesting things that I do think is potentially a planning issue is the inclusionary zoning mm -hmm. um, stuff that's starting to be talked about now. And um, I think there was an article in the paper, maybe just last week or the week before, talking about um, uh, talking about inclusionary zoning in places like Kew and Turak. Um, and all those lovely leafy suburbs, um, Hawthorne. And um, I actually think it's really important. I think we've seen the echo chambers say that our social media turns into, and I think it's really important that we think about broadening the demographic in our suburbs because um, we don't want our suburbs to become similar echo chambers. I mean, it's really important to kind of 
get out and about and see people that are different from you and meet people that are different from you and have different worldviews from you and understand the world differently from you and have different needs from you. And if we turn our suburbs into these echo chambers, um, then I don't think we're doing things responsibly. So I'm really hoping um, inclusionary zoning starts to become really a huge part of the conversation, but I, I'm not quite sure where it's at. So can you, what is, what is inclusionary zoning? I think inclusionary zoning, at a, at a kind of very broad level, um, it asks to include a certain amount of affordable or social housing um, in planning over, over an area. I don't think any council's taken it up. I think the City of Melbourne has a draft um, plan to take it up. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on it. So I thought um, Colleen might. Yeah, you see it in Sydney and in Brisbane. So they both have provisions in their planning controls, but it's effectively would say that um, if you have a block of land and it has the potential for say 80 dwellings, 10% of those must be social or affordable housing. And there's a sliding scale of um, percentage of 30% of, of salary that would link it either to affordable or social housing. And in another um, mechanism that New South Wales do is called uplift. So that's where um, if land is rezoned to um, residential and there's generally speaking an increase in value of that land that comes about because of that, that at that point, that's where there's a mandatory requirement for say 10% of the housing on that land to be provided for affordable housing. So they're the sorts of mechanisms where you need to capture it at the point where there is a, a significant gain and rezoning is all at the time of planning approval. That's when there are significant windfalls to be held typically for the property owner. Yes. And of course, if developers knowing that that is the case, they can then adjust that into their um, equations when they're working out what the acceptable price is to pay for a property. If they know that they have to provide five or 10 or even 20% social or affordable housing, then they will adjust their prices accordingly. And of course, the price of property will adjust. Okay. Um, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit. I'm really, I, I'm sort of interested to know, um, I think, you know, we've got a, I think the parlor audience in general is, is very interested in, in finding a voice, having a voice advocacy um i'm interested to know what that's meant for you um individually and professionally and i think you've probably got slightly different stories here i, I know colleen um a conversation we had a long time ago you said that the kind of worries about it impacting negatively on the practice um were not realized and in fact quite the opposite is that yeah, look, I think initially we were we, we, we were realistic about what it might mean. Um, and I, I, I think it's fair to say that there were probably some mistakes made along the way, but nothing that was particularly fatal. Um, part of that was just learning how to better navigate social media um, and those mechanisms. And of course, um, using both traditional and new forms of media to get your message across. None of those mistakes were particularly significant, but they were little, just little bumps along the way. Do that differently next time, do that better, don't go there. Um, and of course, the big issue is always playing the issue, not the man, um, both literally and figuratively. Um, and one of the, I guess, silver linings, although this, this can never be the motivation for doing it, is that it did, I think, raise the profile of ratio in the community, both within our peers, but also within sort of client group. And based on that, we were then able to better leverage our capacity to make a positive contribution. So for example, um, some of you may or may not get the newsletters that we issue most weeks, um, keeping people up to date and giving opinions on changes in issues or you know, planning controls or traffic um, related matters. Um, but we always try to give opinions with those as opposed to just sort of regurgitating updates to planning controls. But we found that that overall, we think that that's had quite a healthy impact in terms of raising the 
firm profile and hopefully raising the respect that people within the community have for us. And so when we, and a lot of what we do as consultants is we give opinions about things. So, you know, a client will come to us with their architect and say, can I get eight stories on this site or can I build to this boundary or, you know, can I put a petrol station here? They're always very glamorous ones. Um, and we give an opinion and hopefully because they respect our opinions more broadly, they will then listen to us um, perhaps a little more intently um, than they might have otherwise. Um, so on the whole, it, it's been quite good for the business, but I think what we have also learnt too is that, you know, just taking back to what you asked before, Justine, is that if we are going to advocate on an issue, it has to be something that we're really passionate about and you just simply can't go about it because you think that there might be reputational gain to be had. Um, and I don't know if, it, if anyone's recently... Um, watch the recent movie Prom. There's a really great show on Netflix about four out of work um, Broadway stars that deliberately try and advocate for gay rights um, in order to raise their personal profile. So there's a really good lesson there about you've got to come from the heart, it can't come from the head. Mm. Tanya. Well, I do think you have to be mindful. I mean, I think one of the reasons we were, all, like all of the architects involved with citizens, like directly with citizens from Melbourne, um, run their own practices pretty much. Um, so we have that ability to speak out. We didn't have to go through layers of um, management to kind of then then have a voice um, or be able to speak out, which was fantastic. I do have to admit though, I didn't get a job interview that I thought I was going to get this year because I was deemed to be too political, which is really interesting uh, to me. Um, because I just think of myself mostly as an advocate, although I did then run for council because I thought, well, you know, bugger it. <laughs> That's the way I've already looked at. Here we go. Um, no, but um, but I think also, you know, but it's it, it's on balance, isn't it, really? Like, you know, I would have been upset if I didn't speak out and I didn't advocate to the full extent of my abilities. And I understand a lot more about how the world of the built environment works in a really broad sense now. And I'm really passionate about good government and good governance um, because of it. So I think it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me to get involved in other things. And I've had conversations in the past couple of years with people who I would never have met, um, you know, through a more traditional form of practice. And, you know, I've met I think my favourite thing, I mean, the worst thing about running for council during COVID is that we couldn't actually meet people in person. And my favourite thing is meeting all the strange and wonderful people who are super passionate about strange and wonderful different things. Um, so maybe it's partially because I'm just really nosy. But um, yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, on the whole, I think kind of standing up for certain things um, has been a really positive experience. You have reminded me, Tanya, though, I did. I have applied for a couple of board positions, um, statutory boards, and I have missed out on them. And I do strongly suspect, like you, I'm deemed to be too political. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's actually a healthy reminder. I've blocked it out of my memory because I was so disappointed at the time. Yeah, but it is, I think it swings and roundabouts, you know. Like, you, you, there, I, th I think, you know, by far the weight of what I've gained through the process and how I understand how the world works now and the kind of things that I'm, I can kind of see my way through advocating for at the moment. Um, yeah, it's, it's left me in a much better place. So I'm interested, um, or we're interested in knowing uh, a little bit about what advice you would have for those who, are, who would like to, you know, develop a stronger voice. And I wonder if we might start getting to that side of the conversation by going to uh, our very good friend and excellent answer of questions, Badru Ahmed. <laughs> Badru, do you want to put your question? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Justin, again. Uh, I think I've written the question just as I would have asked it directly to a friend. <laughs> like, I feel like there's a paradox in today's world that we have a voice now more than we ever did in history, I think. But then because the world is so sensitive and so touchy, I'm afraid of using that voice because I'm afraid I will offend someone or something. Now, I know I can't please everyone, but then suddenly begins a witch hunt of, oh, you said this, oh, you think that. And what advice 
would you have to balance that political correctness with politeness, with respect? And I don't know. It's it's a, it's a big paradox. I struggle with it every second. So yeah. I mean, perhaps the first place is to stay off social media because that's obviously the the bastion <laughs> of the nasty and the mean. Um, and I think, um, Badra, it probably really just depends on what it is that you're wanting to speak up about. I think every approach probably needs to be bespoke to the issue at hand. But just having intelligent, constructive conversations, that's the first place to start. Obviously, being respectful of different points of view. Um, but I think, you know, if, if we can start there and then the way in which that advocacy might lead will hopefully come out of conversations with others and and perhaps joining of forces with other like-minded individuals. Yep. This, this is going to sound maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but I think you have to be, and I found this kind of hard to do, but I think you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable and to realise that you're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. and to have conversations with people who are willing to have the conversations with you to correct you. So um, because those are the kind of ways you develop your understanding of an issue. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, like last year, Christine and I uh, worked with Vision Australia and we installed 3,500 custom-made tactile indicators in the um, in the courtyard of the Immigration Museum. We led for Melbourne Open House, and we led over 500 people uh, through the installation blindfolded. Um, and I personally, I don't think Christine had either, ever worked with people with low vision or blindness. And we were interested initially at it from an architectural point of view, like how do we read the city? These are things that we read the city. They're really interesting. Um, and then through that process, you start to meet different people. We, um, we actually had a deaf, we had some deaf people come on the tours uh, with us as well. So that was also, that was something else that we hadn't thought about. And all of a sudden we had to think about, um, but it's actually just being willing to have conversations with people, I think, and to start to understand different points of view. It helps you build empathy for different people's pos positions. It helps you also um, understanding people's different perspectives, whether they're arguing with you or they're you know, trying to help you is great because it helps you build your argument or build confidence in what you know. So you can say, well, I've thought about that um, and I respect that, but here's the way I look at it. Or I've thought about that and that's fantastic and I'm gonna take this forward. Um, so you kind of have to just accept that you're probably gonna stuff up at some point and suck it up. <laughs> it's that good advice. I don't that's a very it. good advice. <laughs> You, ha you do have to be open to criticism, but preferably that criticism should be constructive. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think that Colleen made the point before of always trying to be respectful, play the issue, not the person. Um, those were absolutely key um, in, you know, in the way I think about the world and hopefully the way we ran our campaign as well. So think about it from those perspectives. Try to. No, thank you. That's, um, that's, that's good advice for the end of the year, for sure. <laughs> Stay up 2020, it'll be fine. We're moving. Oh God, on. less dramatic 2021, please. <laughs> uh. Sarah, as somebody who you're who was, you know, also a very strong and effective advocate, do you want to um, maybe have the last uh, the last what say or question? <laughs> well, both. I mean, I actually <laughs> want to ask you some of those questions, but then you, you're meant to be. Definitely. I'm not meant to do that, so. <laughs> I'm interested in your thoughts, though, around the kind of reactive question which you asked. Mm. Um, in the context of the Indigenous conversation, I find that it's a mix of both reactive and active advocacy, um, specifically because there are so many elders and, and people from our communities that have come before us that have advocated and they've fought and they have been allowed voice. And at least within the architectural profession, we now have like people are listening, and also people are going to have to listen because everything, every everything's changing, um, and specific key things actually are changing that will require everyone to um, work with some understanding of country and traditional owners. But anyway, um, I think for me, uh, I try to focus more on the active than the reactive approach of advocacy because 
it seems, at least in the context of this conversation, that um, or maybe evidenced by the the my least favourite question at public talks is how do we start? Um, and uh, in yeah, I don't know. So if you if you keep getting asked that question, then clearly you need to define for people what it is that they could do. Therefore, publicly advocating in an active way actually creates more change than a reactive one. Um, but of course, there are issues that need reactive and they're more immediate, but I think we it's a slower active conversation. I don't know if that made any sense, but hopefully it did. No, I think that your answer there is a really good example about different perspectives. And so Tanya and I come to this as white women and we have a white female lens to our experience. And as an Indigenous person, your perspective and experience is so radically different to ours. And so that completely understands and informs how you would take a different approach to your advocacy. And for me, that's incredibly illuminating to hear your response. So thank you. I actually think, I, sorry, go no, I was just gonna say, I thought that question was great because I actually prefer, I probably prefer the active forms <laughs> of advocacy. Um, because the reactive ones are really hard and exhausting and confronting um, and you do them and you kind of get through them and you're like, yes, I got through that. But yeah, it, it's actually, you know, they're quite tiring. Whereas the active ones, you can kind of build, build passion around and you can, you know, you can bring people, it's easier to bring people along because you've got a bit more time to plan it. And um, so I thought that question was fantastic. And then I think, you know, the, the idea of building on it, a history of advocacy um, that was something I felt was really lacking in my personal, you know, my personal skills. Like I had no idea what I was doing when I got involved. And so, um, and, and thinking about it now, maybe, you know, maybe I would have talked to more people who had a history of advocacy and seen, and seen what happened at the start, because I think we often forget things. We, we were in the middle of a fight. We think it's, the, you know, it's the, the only fight or the only, you know, the only fight that's ever been fought, but there is a lot of stuff and knowledge around if we just look for it and as as um sarah the other sarah has just said in the comments being at this sort of active approach puts you on the front foot it also i think lets you be opportunistic so certainly with parlor we just kind of fight you know we're very opportunistic something has you know we kind of see a gap and we try and make something out of it um and i think play you know the act, active kind of indicates a sort of a longer game but you need both I mean absolutely okay um I'm very conscious that I always run over we always run over time when we don't have Naomi here to keep us in order and I say that every time she's not here as well so <laughs> we'll try and wrap up but thank you very much both of you um thank you Sarah I'm so happy to have you here with us um um I'm so thrilled that we're <laughs> the end of this year as I'm sure everybody is I really um want to thank Monash um Monash I think when they signed up to support us with this event series I think Naomi had an idea there might be five I always thought there'd be more but I don't think anyone imagined that there'd be 30 and so um Monash's support and um helping us run weekly events is uh really substantial and we really really thank them and um particularly in terms of uh, they really help us get the videos up online and get the cat, you know, anyway. So thank you very much to Monash. We've really, really loved the opportunity to work with them. And thank you also to, to all of our partners. Again, Parla's done a huge amount this year and it's really only possible because we have that support um, from fantastic partners, University of Melbourne, Brickworks, AWS, who are just, extraordinary always have been um uq who are supporting our lab series uh i'm gonna forget somebody uh the Build environment um, channel uh anyway there's lots and lots of partners and we thank you all because i'm not going to try and name you all because i know i'll make a mess of it um so thank you but thank you also to the audience we wouldn't have um had these extraordinary events and we wouldn't have kept them going for so many um sessions had we not been getting such a great response and and um i do feel like we've made lots of new friends and colleagues and um comrades in the process uh we are having a well-deserved break we're coming back uh we will come back continue to do online events next year i'm not quite sure yet what shape they will be um but and I'm not sure that they'll be weekly because <laughs> I'm not sure I can 
<laughs> survive. Um, but uh, we have got all sorts of new plans um, that uh, we will be working through um, once we've had a rest. So I hope everyone has a lovely um, break and um, thank you all for being here with us. And <laughs> Thank you, Justine, for all the fabulous work you do. Yeah, so I was just going to say thanks to um, Justine and Sarah and all of the parlour folk because we know that you're doing wonderful work. So I'm so glad to see how wonderful your advocacy has gone. Okay, well, we're only two minutes late. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for, you know, everything. But coming up with a name and, you know, being here at the end. Thank you so much.